Father, as we get ready to look into your word, unctionize me. In the name of Jesus, amen. I'm going to ask you to stand in recognition to the word of God. Amen. And would you open your Bible this morning to the book of Hebrews. Now we want to look into the book of Hebrews and I'm going to go backwards. First we're going to look at Hebrews, the third chapter. And I want us to begin at verse, let's begin at verse 8. Hebrews, the third chapter, and we're going to begin at verse 8. And we're going to read down to verse 13. Now, I may not expound on all of these verses this morning, but I do want you to study these verses when you go home. <clears throat> Third chapter and beginning at verse 8, and I'm re reading from the King, King James Version, the old Elizabethan English. Do you have it? Yes. Harden not your hearts as in the provocation, in the days of temptation, in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Wherefore I was grieved with that generation, and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my right, they shall not enter my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Now one more passage of scripture and it's found in Hebrews, the second chapter of Hebrews, the second chapter of Hebrews, and it's verse 3. The second chapter of Hebrews, and it's verse 3. Do you have it? Let's read it together so we can familiarize ourselves. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord as it was confirmed to us by them that heard him. Father, again we ask for your unction. Give me your power and understanding and application. Give your people receptive hearts. Let us hide your word in our hearts so that we won't sin against you. Yes, Lord. We give you thanks this morning. In Jesus' name. Jesus. Amen. Now, what we're going to look at this morning is God's message to a backsliding, <coughs> born again believer. God's message to a backsliding, born again believer. If you study through the book of Hebrews, there are five mighty exhortations found in the book of Hebrews. We're going to look at just two of them this morning, and just briefly. I'm going to comment on these two and then comment briefly on the third. Briefly. Amen? A backsliding born again believer is a born again believer that is no longer fighting the good fight of faith. God tells us over there in 1 Timothy to fight. This is a fight. Satan is fighting. And we've got to fight. If you will not fight, you will backslide. 
Bottom line. When you start fighting, you're going to backslide. Yes. And you see people backsliding everywhere. Yes. Backsliding. Mm -hmm. Backsliding. I love that scripture over there in the book of Jeremiah, though. It said God is married to the backslider. To the backslider. Hey, back. He won't divorce you. He'll speak to you, but I'm going to show you what the third thing he'll do when we backslide. Every sermon when a preacher gets up to preach, it's not always to make us feel good. Amen. Mm. Baby Christians want the preacher to preach a sermon every Sunday to make them feel good. That's not the purpose of real preaching. That's baby Christians. And I'm not going to deal with it. There's a portion in here, they were baby Christians, and they wanted to feel good sermon. Some sermons should make us cry. Amen. Amen. They should. Some sermons should arouse guilt in us, especially when something needs to be fixed. Amen. And sometimes you need to be comforted. Amen. So I don't know about this sermon, it's a little rough. <laughs> but I heard this text when I was asleep. I heard Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 3 in my sleep. You know, I woke up. It was God speaking to my inner man. Your inner man never sleeps. Only your body sleeps. That's why you dream at night. There's a part of you who never sleeps. And I heard it. Because I was preparing another sermon this morning. God's message to the backslide born again believer. When we refuse to get up every morning and dress up in the full armor of God, we're going to begin to drift. I like to think of it in the morning because my favorite scripture, one of them over there, is in Psalm 5 and verse 3. My voice shall thou hear in the morning. And will, he said, look up, because he's up there. Yes. Yes. My voice. And what I'm asking God every morning, every morning. Some morning, I don't feel like getting out of bed, but I get out of there. Mm -hmm. I get out of that bed in the morning. And I ask God, help me to dress up this day in the full armor of God. Strengthen me. And then before I leave in my car, I always confess the providential sovereignty of God over my life. God saved me, and God is in control. Therefore, I do not believe no weapon that's formed against me is going to prosper that day. It's not going to prosper. Every tongue that's going to rise against me, I'm going to defeat it. Because God is in control. When you believe that God is in control, before you start out, you will continue to grow. Amen? Amen. So the first message here to the backsliding person, that person that's drifting slowly away from God, away from his word, is found in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 3. He says here, it's a question. It's a rhetorical question. It's interesting. How shall we escape if we neglect no 
truth is, not salvation, but so great salvation. Implied in that powerful, rhetorical question is a consequence. It's implied there. And we must ask, God wants us, you, me, us, to ask ourselves this question. Because there's a price tag connected if we neglect this great salvation. This great. It's not just salvation. It's a great salvation. Amen. That he has provided for us. It's great. Because God gave his only son. Not only to die on the cross. Are you listening? Amen. <clears throat> he hung out there for six hours. But for three of those hours, he was smitten. That's what the prophet say, Isaiah 53. He was smitten three of those hours and afflicted. Why? By God. Why? Because he was made into sin. Your sins. My sins. God can't even look on evil. A bit of one thirteen, God's eyes are so holy, he can't even look on evil. So what he did when he was out there for three, that's why it got dark. It didn't get dark early. For three hours, all of a sudden, it turned dark because he was, God was afflicting him. He was being smitten by God. God hates Sin. We don't hate it, but God does. Amen. It caused something. It's a great salvation. It wasn't cheap. Neglect means show little interest. I don't care about it. I'll just get on up in the morning and walk on out there. I got angels to watch over me. Don't take it for granted. Amen. Amen. Don't take it for granted. That's what God said. Don't take it for granted. That salvation is so great. Are you listening? Amen. Amen. God's perfect plan. Perfect. For everyone's life, every born again person's life in this room is in your your personal salvation. It's not in mine. God's perfect plan for your life is not in my salvation. He put it in yours. His perfect plan. People say, I don't know God's will for my life. Well, renew your mind. Amen. That's all. It ain't no big deal. Romans 12 and verse 2. If you want to know God's perfect plan for your life, meditate on Romans 12 and verse 2. In that verse, it says, be transformed. It's a process. It's a process. It's a metamorphosis, but it's a process. By the renewing of the mind. The mind has to be transformed from the inside to the outside. Because he's not going to show you his will for your life until your mind is transformed. Because you couldn't handle it. Once the mind is transformed, then you will discover that his will is good. Why do they call it good? Because it's intrinsically good. It emanates from God. It's good. It's perfect. That 
that's an all comprehensive word. Are you listening? Everything that's going to touch your life on this earth is included in that perfect will of God so you don't have to worry about anything. Amen. God's got your back. Amen. You said I'm worried. You, know, you shouldn't be worried because God's plan is a perfect. That means it's all inclusive. Everything that's going to touch your life down here, God has already covered. Amen. The money you need, the strength to fight the battles. But as are you listening? Amen. Amen. As the will is revealed, you must, according to James chapter one and verse five, asking for wisdom because you're gonna have to make some decisions. You got to make a decision. You're gonna to have to have discernment. You got to know which road to take. So James said, "One and five, asking for wisdom. All this is in the perfect will. There's something else in the perfect will of God. Are you listening? Amen. Romans eight and twenty-eight. Do you know what it is? Who knows what Romans eight and twenty-eight is? All things work together. Do you know? Do you know? All things. All things, yeah. Because you're going to have some trials. Did you know that that's part of the will of God, the trial that you're going through this morning? Because the reason why, the purpose of the trial, verse 29, is to conform us. We have been conformed to the image of Christ. He's getting us ready. All this is part of the will of God. That's why they call it a great salvation. It's not just salvation. It's a great salvation. In that great salvation is the word of God the gifts of the Spirit, the Holy Ghost, gifts and blessings, they call them gifts. When you get over there, God will give you gifts if you're faithful. It's in your blood, it's in the plan. Also, and I love this part, it said my salvation is in yours. There's a mansion. But it's unique. Your mansion is not going to look like my mansion. I love that. And you're going to go over there to the throne and say, Lord, I just love that place. And he just will smile. He said, I know you like it. <laughs> Amen. Amen. It's a great salvation. Amen. It's great. Amen. God said, don't neglect it. When you take something for granted, it's because you don't know what you have. Did you hear that? You don't like no one taking you for granted. That, that tees you off. And God doesn't like us taking him for granted down here. Amen. That's why they put that in. That's, it's a rhetorical question that we got to answer. Everybody in here. How shall we escape? There's a consequence if you neglect it. You know of somebody that's neglected their salvation. Everybody's room. They're going the wrong way. Everybody's room. You know of somebody. I hope it's not you. Don't neglect it, God said. It costs me too much. I gave my all. That's why God spoke that to me. Now that can I make a personal confession to you? I was running home every day from the office and turning on the television and looking at the Democrats. And I was sitting there for hours and God said, you neglected me. Bernie didn't make no solve this problem. Amen. Amen. 
Amen. Amen. Amen. It's going to take God. Amen. God is the only one to solve all these problems. Don't let them folks fool you. Pray for them. But you better look to God. Yes. Look to Him. He's the one that's going to keep us. Because we're pilgrims. And we're strangers. We're just passing through. Amen. Amen. How shall we escape? Because if we neglect it, we're going to get a drift. That's a bad thing. So God wants us, everyone in this room, how shall I escape if I neglect this great salvation that God has provided for me? That's a powerful question. Amen. It's powerful. Look then at the second. God's second message is in Hebrews chapter 3. And the bottom part of verse 13. Hebrews is a drifting Christian. A Christian, a born again Christian that has drifted. And on the wrong road. And God says in Hebrews chapter 3 and the bottom part of verse 13 that when you drift, your heart will become hard. That's bad. That's bad. Why? Right there in verse 13. Because of the deceitfulness of sin. Sin is tricky. Call you to have a hard heart. If you drift away, that's why God warned us here. He's warning this preacher. I don't want to drift. Brothers and sisters, I don't want to drift. I see folks drifting every day. I get out on my knees. There's been time in my room before my God, because I don't want to drift. When the heart becomes hard, look at what happens in verse 12. It develops into an evil heart. A hard heart is an evil heart. Born again person that is drifting. First the heart becomes hard. Then it, be it becomes evil. When the heart becomes evil, it doubts God's word. Yes. You no longer believe. God has given us in this book over 7,000 promises. Seven in the Bible means complete. And in this book, there are over 7,000 promises made by God. There's 9,000, but there's 7,000 to us. Such as, when you pass through the water, I'll be with you. Yeah. Through the flood, it's not going to overflow you. When you go through the fire, it's not going to burn you. Neither will the flames kindle upon you. For I the Lord your God. I'm your father. I can protect you. 7,000. But when your heart becomes hard, you'll no longer be able to believe God's word. Church, that's bad. I don't want to ever get like that. God, please help me. I don't want to ever get to the place where I can't believe God's word. That's Amen. what hard, evil heart will do. Amen. Born again person sanctified, had been sanctified, but drifted away from that great salvation. You're only down here a short while. We're all going to leave here soon. Deceived by the deceitfulness of sin. That's what happens to a backsliding Christian. Look at those same verses. Beginning in verse 8. He gives an illustration 
of God's covenant people developing a hard heart. And guess what? God went down. They had been down into Egypt 400 years. <coughs> and when God sent a man down there by the name of Moses, and the only thing he gave him was a staff. He didn't give him a, a machine gun. That's something. That was the most powerful country in the world, but nothing but a staff. And said, go down there and get him. My God was great. Yeah. Amen. Say, you go down and tell Pharaoh, he represented the devil, let my people go. Yeah. And you know what happened? Pharaoh said, no. And you know what happened? Mm -hmm. God brought them out. Yeah. God brought them out when they got to the Red Sea. Guess what happened? Mm. God parted the Red Sea and they went across on dry land. Yeah. That's a miracle. Yeah. Amen. But when the enemy tried, something happened. Yes. There were dead bodies everywhere. When they didn't have no water, guess what happened? Mm -hmm. God took a rock and turned it into a fire. Yeah. God is a great God. Yeah. Amen. Every morning they could go out, all you have to do is carry a bowl. Food came down from heaven. Amen. God is a great God. Yes, he is. That's why I know God will provide. Yes. yes. He hasn't changed. God has not changed. This is a great salvation. Yeah. Church, we all not neglect. Amen. We should not neglect this great, great salvation that our God has provided for us through Jesus Christ. Amen. It cost him something. It costs God something. Don't drift. People are saying today, I don't need to go to the house of God. The devil's fooling you. Amen. Amen. God told us to assemble together. Why? Because we're joints in ligaments. I need you. You need me. That's where God has put us together. We need each other. Amen. We need to encourage each other. Yes. We got to encourage each other. He said in the text, we're to encourage each other. Amen. So that we will not drift and slip away from this great salvation yes. that our God, hallelujah, hallelujah, has provided for us. It's great. It's great. Let me tell you then, in closing, what happens when a backsliding, born again believer will not listen to God? Now, God will talk. My father used to look at me, he said, I'll get you. I'm going to get you. <laughs> you know what I mean? And you know, we had to go to church every Sunday. Uh, my father would get up, and all, he never whipped you on Sunday. I never, ever got a whipping on Sunday, but I got a lot on Monday. <laughs> that was the holy day. <laughs> my father didn't whip. He called it the Sabbath day. I wanted to correct him, but you couldn't correct my father. He called it the Sabbath day. It was the holy day. Let's look at what happens when we won't listen to God. I'm going to read it to you. And then we're going to take a minute. Beginning at verse Rome, uh, Hebrews 12 and beginning verse 5. I want you to note certain things in these verses. What you will see is two key words. Chastising and scourging. He will take action. Scourging means to punish. I know the prosperity preachers don't preach it, but it's right here. God will put something on you. 
if you don't listen to me. It's right here. The key word is sons. In the King James Version, it says one word is children. That's wrong in the Greek. The word is sons because he's speaking to mature Christians. He ain't speaking to babies. Sons. Now I'm going to begin to read it. And you, verse 5, and you have forgotten the exhortation or encouragement which speaketh unto you as unto, that should be sons. My son, my son, you're mine, my daughter. Despise not thou the chastening of the Lord. It's to a born again believer that's backsliding. Chastening, child training. Despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Why does he do it? For whom the Lord loveth. Some parents don't believe in ripping their children because they're afraid of dying. My daddy didn't believe in that. For whom the Lord loveth. He's he chasteneth and punishes, scourges. He gets rough. He's not going to let us destroy the evidence of God. Amen. It's not going to happen. Mm. He'll take action. And scourges every son <clears throat> or daughter whom he received. Now what happens? If Ye endure chastening, this correction. God dealing with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are you bastards or Ill illegitimates. You're not my child. You're not my child. I'm correcting my children. Yes. You're not my child. So you can just do what you want. Judgment awaits you. Mm -hmm. But God is going to correct us. Amen. Amen. He's going to purify us. Yes. And when we're going to walk in there, we're going to walk in there holy folks. you got a plan. He got a purpose. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence, respect. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? The implication here is that if we don't listen to God, he may take us out of this world. Amen. That's the implication. That's the implication. I, I don't want to listen to him. Well, he, he's not going to let you destroy the evidence of Calvary. He ain't going to let me take you out of this world. Sooner than he, than you, he had a plan. He had a plan. But you wouldn't listen. So he has to bring us home. Don't mean you laws and just bring you in. You might lose your reward when you get up there. Church, let's obey God. Amen. That's all I'm trying to say. We must obey God. My heart was broken when I hear how people that have gone astray. I didn't, I'm not going to preach you on it, but when a person is going astray, if you look at that in Hebrews chapter 3, People that's going astray will provoke you. Amen. They'll talk to you like a dog. Amen. And no respect. They might even curse you out. Born again believer. Born again believer. They provoked God. And folks will provoke us. Mm -hmm. Go astray. Go astray. Father, thank you for your message. Correct us. 
We want to obey you. You died for us. And we give you thanks today for Jesus and for his death on that cross. Now we worship you. Turn around that backsliding Christian. Bring her back to God. Bring him back to God. In love. And in mercy. We give you thanks. We give you praise. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen.